Well, good morning, Worship Center. How are you all doing this morning? Good? All right. I like it. I like it. We got a hand clap. One more time. I feel like you want to shout. How you doing? <laughs> awesome. Well, welcome to church. Welcome to those of you that are watching online this morning. We get to celebrate a little bit because we are introducing you to some brand new Worship Center members. So check out the screen. So those folks have recently completed our Count Me In class. Count Me In is a three-week class where you can learn a little bit about who we are as a church. You can greet some really awesome people, I should say meet some really awesome people. And then also at the end of that class, you'll have the opportunity to decide if you want to become a member of Worship Center. So if you are interested in doing that, maybe you're new here, or maybe you've been coming for a few months, you can check out worshipcenter.org slash Count Me In. There's a lot of information there that you can check out and decide if Count Me In is the spot for you. All right, this morning, everybody, why don't you stand to your feet before we head into worship? I want to read a little bit of the word. Does that sound good? Sounds good. We're going to read from Philippians. We want to posture, not Philippians, <laughs> Philippians on my brain. This is Hebrews. We want to posture our hearts for a time of worship. At the end of chapter 10, verse 18, it says, and when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. You know, Jesus is the sacrifice for us once and for all, amen? And it goes on to say in verse 19, and so, in other words, because of this, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. And as you've learned last week, you know, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to reveal Jesus. So as we posture our hearts this morning to worship Jesus, let's welcome the Holy Spirit into our hearts to be the one who reveals Jesus. To be the one who reveals Jesus as our great high priest. Because of the work that he's done on the cross, we can enter in. So Jesus, we love you. We love you, Jesus. Actually, as a church at this time, why don't you stretch out your hands and posture your heart into this place where we say, Jesus, we want you. So Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus to us this morning. You are the one that makes Jesus real. So we fix our eyes on you, Jesus, not our stuff that we carried into this place, but our great high priest. And Jesus, we love you. We are here to worship you. So Spirit, move through this place. You are welcome here. And we submit and yield to you, Holy Spirit. Let's worship him this morning. We come boldly to your throne of grace and mercy. 
We're coming in bold. Oh, 
were dead now made alive all the newness of Christ receiving receiving all the newness of Christ brand new set apart oh we thank you come on let's just thank him let's just thank him we enter your presence with thanksgiving with thanksgiving oh find here a grateful people oh everything changed it's getting harder to recognize the person i was before I encountered Christ, I don't walk like I used to. I don't talk like I used to. I've been washed from the inside. I've been washed from the inside. Come on. Hallelujah. We honor you, Lord. We honor you. I know it was the blood. Could have only been the blood.
never been about performance, perfection, or striving for acceptance. Let me tell you, it's only oh come on. It's never been about deserving or earning. It's a gift that's free that Jesus gave. Let me tell you.
Isn't he worthy? The Lamb of God. Isn't he worthy? His blood poured out for us. Isn't he wonderful, beautiful in every way? Didn't he wash our sin and o'er the pain his body slain? So we sing, holy, holy is the Lord, worthy, worthy sings the earth to the Lamb of God, crucified, He's Jesus, the name
you deserve it you deserve the glory and the honor so we lift you high and we Father, we are gathered in your Son's name, in the name of Jesus, the name above all names, the one who is called holy and worthy. We didn't come today just to sing songs, but we came to worship, to join with heaven's song that's already going on, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who was and is and is to come, the one who is seated high and lifted up. But the one who is with us, this King of kings, whose kingdom will, eat, will last forever, Civilizations will come and go. Kingdoms will rise and fall, but there's only one king that his, the kingdom will endure forever. And that's the King of kings, Lord of lords, the one who we worship. So God, I thank you for this time together that we can be in your presence. It's your presence that changes us from the inside out. I just feel compelled to pray for anyone who may not know Jesus yet. Maybe you have a friend or family member, maybe a son or a daughter or a parent, maybe a coworker. If God brings to mind someone in your life who you've been praying for to come to know Jesus, I just want us to pray. So God, we pray that the eyes of their understanding would be open to the truth. I want to encourage you just to pray for whoever it is in your life. God, I pray for uh, the truth to be seen and the truth to set them free. God, I read in Corinthians that it's the God of this world that veils people. It's like a veil that keeps them from seeing and keeps them from believing. But, so God, I pray that their hearts will be softened and that, that this veil would be removed in the name of Jesus and they would see who you are by the power of your Holy Spirit. And God, I pray for every person who is lifting up a name and praying for that person. God, I pray that we would just simply say, how can we be a part of revealing Jesus to that person? How can we be a part of that? Uh, so I pray for that, and I pray that all would come to know you. God, I also pray for our missionaries, global partners serving all around the world. So grateful for the work that they're doing. And I pray, especially for those who may be in very difficult 
situations right now, maybe civil unrest or wars going on, God, would you give them peace and joy today? God, that they would feel that the, the power of the Holy Spirit to, to proclaim the good news of Jesus to people who are in need. God, I pray for your protection around them and their families. I pray for clarity and a vision. I pray for your provision in their life. And God, it's just amazing that you allow us to go into the world, all the world, preach this gospel of Jesus Christ and make disciples who, and, and teach them to obey everything that Jesus taught. God, what a privilege it is. May we never lose sight of that. That's our calling as a church to follow these words Jesus gave. And I pray, God, that we would stay focused, not get distracted, but stay focused on the mission you've given us. And I pray that in Jesus' name, and if you're in agreement with that, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Well, it's so good to worship together. God is good. You know, Hebrews chapter 10, we, uh, Kelly and I were just with our Count Me In uh, classes going on right now. We just pop in and say hi. And just brought to mind Hebrews 10, where Hebrews teaches, Scripture teaches us, don't neglect gathering together even more so as the day of the return of Jesus draws near. So the closer that day comes, we should be more intentional to gather together, not less. Make it a priority. I know you do, you're here, so you're making it a priority. It's for the other people, right? <laughs> but it's just such, it was just such a reminder to me, like this is so necessary, doing what we're doing right now. It's just so necessary to encourage each other, to stir one, one another up to good works to not give up, persevere, hold on to the faith. This is, this, this is so needed, so I'm so grateful to be together. All right, you can go ahead and be seated. Thank you guys for leading us. And I'm gonna do um, giving at the end of the service, so uh, just remind me, because um, I just wanna jump right into God's word today. You know, this word is living and active <laughs> this word is like a two-edged sword and pierces our hearts. Two-edged sword in the hand of a skilled swordsman is going to know, not just chopping, you know, whatever, but knowing how to just get in there and cut out what needs to be cut out. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. That's what Hebrews says. And so my approach to sermons, you know, I've been doing lead pastor responsibilities, doing this thing. I know that's how it sounded. I've been doing this thing for, but I've been, you know, trying to figure out how to teach the Bible for the last six and a half years. And there were so too many times, it's like I would look for the scripture and then spend more time giving, you know, what's my commentary on the scripture? Or what's, what's my insight? Or what, what's, what's my clever story or illustration, you know, hilarious story that I can share? And I just have I've been so convicted of that lately because, you know, my words are going to be like a nice flower that is picked and then a day later it's gonna fade away. But the word of God endures forever. So when we come together today, I don't want to just give you my opinion. You know, you've been hearing people's opinions all week, right? Blah, 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 all week long. The last thing you need from me is just my opinions on something. I want us to get into God's word because it endures forever. It lasts forever. It's going to outlast me. It's going to outlast my sermons, God's word, and so... We're committed to this. And Worship Center has had a history. I mean, I'm so grateful for Pastor Sam. 40 years of just the DNA is we, we're going to build our lives on God's word. So grateful. But I truly believe God's calling us to take a step deeper into it. And so we've been on this journey. I'm not calling it a sermon series. I'm really calling it a journey to know the Holy Spirit. And last week was not week one. Last week was step one. Today is step two, 
And I want to look at what, the whole, what God's Word says about the Holy Spirit, not what's Matt's opinions, not what's Worship Center's stance. We're going to look at what is God's teaching, Scripture, who the Holy Spirit is. And the best place to start is with what Jesus said. So look at John 15, and these are the, these words that Jesus spoke right before he was going to be arrested and condemned to die. And he gives these final words to his disciples. And I can imagine if I was John, it's like, I just want to write all these things down. I don't think they really understood when Jesus said, I'm going to be crucified. I don't know that they really understood that at this moment, but I'm sure they felt the tension in this moment. And so in John 15, Jesus is saying, He's using this word picture saying, I am the vine, my father is the gardener, and you are the branches. And so if you want to live this life of being a follower of Jesus, you better stay connected to the vine, the source. And so it's like, that's a great word picture. And then the father is the gardener who prunes and prunes away dead branches and branches, healthy branches that aren't producing fruit because the point of being connected to the source, connected to Jesus, is to produce fruit. Amen. And so if you keep reading John 15, then, then you'll start to see Jesus saying, and by the way, when you're connected to me, the world is not going to like you. <laughs> and if I was hearing those words, I'd be like, mm, I don't know, I'm not sure about this. But he said, the reason the world is not going to like you is because they hate me. And so I just want you to count the cost when you decide to follow Jesus and abide in me, Jesus said, and I'll abide in you. And there's this very close personal relationship. There's a cost to it. And so I kind of read this and I've read that through the years and it's like, do I really, am I serious about this commitment to abiding in Jesus? Not just reading some nice words and and pulling some principles out of God's word, but I mean like abiding in him and him in me to the place where I'm going to be in the world, not of it, but in it, and people aren't going to like me because of who I'm connected to. That feels very vulnerable, and this is why I think it's so significant what Jesus says. Right coming out of that in John 15, verse 26, he says this, I will send you the advocate, counselor, helper, Encourager, the spirit of truth, the one who holds truth, the one who can only speak truth, the one who guides us into all truth. And he will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. This is what we talked about last week. The Holy Spirit will come from the Father. Jesus said, I will give you, I will send you, I will give you this advocate, send you this advocate. Come, he will come to you from the Father, and this is what he does. He will testify all about me. Yes, he will teach you all things, teach you how to obey G what Jesus taught. He'll guide you into all truth. That the, at the very core of the Holy Spirit, it, the Holy Spirit will testify all about Jesus. Then, verse 27 Jesus said these words. He said, and you must. Everybody say must. Yes. Now, this really got my attention this week because must is, is kind of like a commandment, right? It doesn't really feel optional. So in Jesus, I mean, it's Jesus. This is not me. It's not somebody else. This is like red letter. Jesus said, and you must. What did he say we must do? He said, you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. So it's this privilege that followers of Jesus have and also a responsibility to obey. You must testify all about me, Jesus said. So let's summarize where we've been so far. Number one, we talked about this last week, the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. Whenever we see the Holy Spirit in operation in Scripture, it is to reveal Jesus. And that tells me whenever we see this Holy Spirit operating today, it's to reveal Jesus. The Holy Spirit's work is to reveal him. Number two, based on what Jesus said, 
the Holy Spirit fills people to reveal Jesus. So the presence of the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you when you place your faith in Jesus. But then there's this filling that happens that Jesus is talking about right here that fills people so they can have the ability to reveal Jesus. And so what I want to do today is look at Acts chapter 2, the first time that this happened. As Jesus said these words, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses telling people everywhere about me, Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And here we are seeing this message of Jesus going out to the ends of the earth. It's just amazing. I mean, Jesus proclaimed that, and we're seeing it today. But when Jesus said those words in Acts chapter 1, then he ascended to heaven. And I just wonder what the disciples, what, what their emotional state was when they heard Jesus say those words. Were they like, oh, this is amazing? Or were they like, whoa, where are you going? What's happening? You know, they just see Jesus ascend to heaven, and then it's like, okay, we got to hold on to these words that Jesus gave because these words are alive. And so I think they were just hanging out until the day of Pentecost. And so I want to read Acts chapter 2. We're going to let God's word speak to us and instruct us today. All right? Is that, our, is that okay? Yeah. All right. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Let's let God's word speak. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered. Do you know what the word bewildered means? I was like, yeah, I know what that means. And I was like, no, I'm not actually sure what that means. So I looked up the definition. Bewildered means completely confused. So they were completely confused what was happening. But it was enough that they came running to what was happening. You know, sometimes God uses confusing things to get our attention. They were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. And they were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, in the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. I would say that's a pretty good picture of diversity, wouldn't you? <laughs> and we hear, this is what the crowd is saying, we hear these people, these Galileans, we probably all spoke one language. We hear them speaking in our own languages, plural, about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying they're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. 
No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. And I don't know if Peter had this memorized or if he pulled out his scriptures, but he just went to it. He said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike. And they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And who is the name of the Lord? Jesus. So the prophet Joel had this picture, this divine prophecy given to him speaking about Jesus. And he transferred, he must have writ, you know, wrote this down hundreds of years before this took place, not really knowing how this was going to be fulfilled. And so now we have this moment on the day of Pentecost. Now, let's just step back for a moment. This, this day of Pentecost, tongues of fire and speaking in tongues showed up. And without an interpretation, I think we could all agree, this is kind of weird. That's how I would see it at least. It's like, what is going on? And I think I would, you know, I know myself, I, I, I can be a little bit cynical or get skeptical. It's kind of my first reaction on things. And so when something just looks weird, something looks off and it's just like, eh, I don't think that's, it doesn't make sense to my logical brain, you know, my human intelligence that I know so much. So I'm like, I, I don't really get that. And without an interpretation of what was happening, I get why people would look at that and be completely bewildered. But sometimes God uses things in a supernatural way that may appear weird to our human logic, but he uses it to awaken us, kind of wake us up out of our stupor. And what I love in this moment is that Peter steps up and all of a sudden it just clicks in his mind. And he gives the interpretation for what was going on. And the first thing he does is he points back to Scripture. And he, he says, look, you know, my fellow Jewish brothers and sisters, listen very carefully to me. What you are seeing is, is not people being drunk. By the way, this is way too early for that anyway. Maybe if it was late at night, I get it. That's different. But he says, first thing in the morning, it's not even really possible to be drunk this early. But what's going on here, he didn't just give his opinion and say, oh, I think I can figure this out. No, he went right to Scripture because he was given this interpretation because now he was spirit-filled Peter, Amen. not just human-minded Peter. And this is a big change in his life. When the Spirit of God came upon him, now he had the Spirit in him because he believed in Jesus, but when the Spirit of God came upon him, all of a sudden, Scripture clicked to him. Because he wasn't seeing things from a human perspective. As we can go back when Peter was interacting with Jesus, before Jesus was crucified, Peter was one of the disciples. He heard Jesus teach. He saw the miracles. I mean, he saw Jesus in the flesh. And Jesus said one time to him and to all the disciples, he said, hey, we're going to Jerusalem. When we get there, the religious leaders, they are going, they're going to uh, falsely accuse me. They're going to reject me. I'm going to be killed, and then I'm going to rise from the dead. On the, I'm going to rise on the third day. And Peter heard these words, and he actually pulls Jesus aside and reprimands him. and said, Jesus, you know, don't talk like that. We would never let that happen to you. We got your back. And Jesus turned to Peter and looked at him. Do you know what Jesus said? He didn't say, oh, man, thanks, Peter. I appreciate that. No, he turns and he looks at Peter right in the eye and he says, get behind me, Satan. 
But then he adds something. He says, you are not seen from God's perspective. You are seeing this, this moment. You are hearing this from a human perspective. And man, when I hear that, I just like, how many times have I just been trying to figure out the world that we live in and how God's word instructs? And I'm like, I just, I, I rely on my human reasoning and, and logic too much. It's like, God, I don't want to be human-minded. I want to be God-minded. I want to understand. I want your ways to be my ways. And that comes through his word. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit that reveals his word, reveals who Jesus is so we see it. And so in this moment, Peter, it just becomes so clear to him. This is what's happening once the Spirit came on him. This is why I think it's so important to examine or re-examine, whether you know a lot about the Holy Spirit or a little bit about the Holy Spirit, or maybe you don't even, you didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. It's important to examine or maybe even re-examine what you believe and what you, your understanding of scripture is. That's what the journey that I've been on. It's just like, God, I, I wanna know your word. I don't wanna rely on something that I was taught years and years ago because what if I was seeing that through a human perspective? Sometimes, have you ever noticed that you know, sometimes there's a season of your life that you can be so sure of and then some years go by and it's like, how did I miss that? Or how did I not know that? I mean, we, I had this experience in a lot of areas of my life. Just recently, my, my brother is... Um, He's digitizing all of our family photos, so he's scanning the photos in, and so we have digital copies of them. So we're going through my mom's, you know, mom's house and cleaning everything, organizing everything. And so his, my niece, his daughter, uh, must have been helping him. So she sent to our family group chat, 16 of us, she sent my seventh grade school picture with no caption. Just sent it to... and. Um, well, here's my seventh grade school picture. There it is. <laughs> and that was quite a response. A little bit too much laughing going on. But then a, a few days later, I was talking with her, and she said, yeah. I was like, oh, you know, isn't that picture hilarious? And she said, yeah, it's pretty obvious that your mom cut your hair. And I was like, actually, no. We actually paid our hard-earned money, paid someone, asked them to give this haircut. That was not a mistake. And, and this was picture day, by the way. I don't know, kids these days, that picture day probably isn't a big deal because if you want a selfie, you can just take one on your phone. You, know, you can take like 100 and then find the perfect one. And if you don't like that one, you can take another 100. But, but in my day, back in the olden days, Picture day was like your one picture for the year. And you didn't even know if it was going to be a good one or not. So you just get your, your favorite shirt, and you practice your best smile, and you get your hair the way you like it. I mean, it's your best. And this is my best right there. So, But I was human-minded, right? Back then, I was, thank, now I'm spirit-filled, and I would never do that. <laughs> you can take that down. That is really distracting. <laughs> but I, I think about that a lot because it's like there's times in my life where I felt so confident about a lot of things and then as you get older it's like why, why did I think that was a good hairstyle <laughs> and so I think examining and just staying in a, in a very humble place and saying God when it comes to your word I don't want to pretend like I understand everything. And if I come across something in God's word that I don't understand, I'm not like, hmm, they probably don't have it right. I'm like, there's probably something I'm missing. And it draws me to it. And I think people deconstruct and kind of walk away from faith way too easily because they didn't understand something in God's word. And it's like, what gives us the right to think, I don't understand it, well, I'm just going to close this now. Instead of just saying, God, I want to stay in this humble place and just say, open my eyes. Reveal your word. So I think spirit-filled Peter is such an example to us. So I want to continue reading verse 22 so that... 
Peter just kind of, he quotes scripture and then he says, people of Israel, listen, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. So he's talking to people that have also seen and heard about Jesus, but it didn't click in their minds who he was. But God knew what would happen and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a a cross and killed him. And Peter's getting a little bit bold right now. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. I mean, what a powerful statement. I mean, these people knew that Jesus had died, and then they either saw, some of them did, but probably most of them only heard that this Jesus who was killed, it was now being testified that he was living. And and Peter's just bringing this to, he's, he's connecting the dots of what's going on. King David said this about him, verse 25. Quoting scripture again, I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence." Now, before the Holy Spirit came, an understanding of that was like, I guess David was just talking about himself there. And Peter said, dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David was not referring to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet. And he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. Again, Peter's just like, all of this is beginning to make sense. How did I not not see this when I was with with Jesus? I can just imagine Peter thinking that. I was just like, oh, I see it now. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. And so what was spoken and predicted by Joel the prophet and by David in the Psalms, it's all making sense now. God raised Jesus from the dead and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, not just to be inside of us, but to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Again, quoting the Psalms. So Peter kind of wraps this point up. He says, let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, by the way, don't forget, you were the ones who crucified him, to be both Lord and Messiah. And Peter just laid it out. Not because he had amazing communication skills, because the Spirit of God revealed something to him about Jesus that he didn't see before. And then this next verse is so powerful to me when I read it. Verse 37 says, Peter's words pierced their hearts. How did his words pierce their heart? It wasn't his human reasoning and logic and A plus B equals C, and this is why this all happened. No, the reason his words pierced their heart is because he was speaking God's word, the living and active word, the the word of God that's like a two-edged sword, piercing, dividing between soul and spirit, exposing our innermost thoughts and desires. That's why this book is so powerful. That's why I never want to just get up here and just be giving you my words. 
And I've been guilty of that too much. I've repented of it. I'm very convicted of it. Because my words are not going to pierce your heart. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. No matter how hard I try, no matter how much time I put into message prep, no matter how clever my little illustration is, it will not pierce your heart. It might make you chuckle. It might be like, oh, that was a good sermon. But to pierce someone's heart, it's got to be God's word. And it, this is what happens. They said to Peter and to the other disciples, brothers, in our language, they'd probably be like, bro, or maybe even bruh, I don't know. They're just like, brothers, what should we do? See, if it was just Peter's words, they would have been like, you're still crazy. I still think you're drunk. But something happened. They were being transformed from the inside out. Now, in this moment, they're going to be, some of you in this room are going to uh, identify with the crowd. And you hear all this and it's like the same thing is happening. Your hearts are being pierced and it's like, what should we do? There's others in this room, you're gonna identify with Peter. And you're just like, man, I, I wanna be in that moment. I wanna be ready. I wanna have words that are pierce somebody's heart and, and ready for that moment. Not because you're on a platform with a microphone teaching about scripture, but just like in your family, in your home, in your interactions with people at work, wherever you are interacting with people. It's like, I just want to be ready for my words to pierce someone's heart so I can point people back to Jesus. Whatever group you identify with, it's very important you hear how Peter answers the question, brothers, what should we do? Here's what Peter said, verse 38. Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Stop living this way and start living this way. Repentance. It might mean you feel bad about what you've been doing, but don't just feel bad about yours. It might cause some godly sorrow, and that's healthy, but it's not just feeling bad and just staying in godly sorrow. It's actually making a change in your life. Repent of your sins and turn to God. I mean, these were converts of Judaism. These were Jews. They were devout Jews. So a lot like they were a bunch of atheists. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of, of your sins. I do think that meant water baptism, but water baptism is so much more than just the act of going into water and coming back out. When you're baptized in, in the name of Jesus, it's like he just washes over and cleanses you from all unrighteousness for the forgiveness of sins. That's why that step is so important. It is a physical act to be water baptized, but it, it will transform you because it's just like, okay, I get it. I'm, I'm going to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you to your children, and to those far away. All who have been called by the Lord our God. So if you feel like, man, I've made too many mistakes. I'm probably disqualified from this. You're not. I'm just letting you know you're not disqualified. This invitation, this promise is to all. Verse 40, then Peter continued preaching for a long time. One of the you know, preacher's favorite verse in scripture. Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. You live among a people who are crooked and perverse and unjust. Can you see it? And he's not saying save yourself. Like you have the ability to save yourself. He's like, be saved from it. Get connected to the vine, we could say. I know that he didn't say that here, but it's like it just brings us back to Jesus' words. Stay connected to the vine. And, the, to the vine. and then when you're in the world, the world is not going to like you. That doesn't mean just completely separate yourself from the world. That just means don't try to live and get the world's approval. Be saved from it. And then verse 41 just 
I love it. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Someone asked me recently, what's our baptism limit on a Sunday service? And I was like, 3,000. There it is. (laughs) If we get more than 3,000, then we have to go to another day. (laughs) But until then, we'll just keep baptizing people. I see in here this uh, miraculous moment, supernatural moment that transformed Peter's life to be spirit-filled Peter. And the very first thing I see are these tongues of fire that came down. Before the speaking in tongues and other languages, before the interpretation, when the Holy Spirit came, the very first thing was tongues of fire. Well, I guess there was a rushing wind first, but I, there, there's these tongues of fire. And I'm like, what, what is that? What are tongues of fire? Like, did they actually see them or was it actually fire? Did it, did it, was it hot? Or was it just a vision that they got? So let's break apart tongues of fire. Tongues represents words, right? Our mouth, our tongue, it's like our dialect. It's how we speak. It's how we communicate to one another. Fire purifies. Fire removes impurities. Fire is a purifier. I mean, the the word fire is literally in the word purifier. (laughs) And so I was thinking about that. Tongues of fire is what was evident when the Spirit came. And it took me to... I just felt like the Spirit took, took me to Isaiah 6. And this is where I want to land the plane today. Isaiah 6 may be a very familiar passage to you, but whether it is or isn't, I just want us to look at it again because Isaiah 6 starts out saying it was the day or it was the year that King Uzziah died. And King Uzziah was a very good king. King of Judah, he reigned 52 years, I think, over 50 years. Honored the Lord for most of his reign and rule. He was well-loved. He obeyed what God commanded them to do. He was finding success. There was peace and protection. He started to gain wealth. And he became famous. And there's this sobering verse in 2 Chronicles, if you, could, if you want to study his kingship, that says he became powerful and he also became proud, which led to his downfall. So he served most of his life just as this king honoring the Lord and serving people until he got really powerful and then pride came in. And he started disregarding God's instructions at the end of his life. I mean, how sad is that? It's pride. It leads to a fall every time. You can count on it. And so in that moment, at the end of King Uzziah's life, he got leprosy and he kind of just faded away. And so the people of Judah, they would have been in this state of like, what's going to happen to our nation? What's going to happen to, the, you know, they were starting to be surrounded by other nations. And are we going to lose our nation? And there was all this uncertainty and unrest. And in that moment, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, he documents this. He said, it was in the year King Uzziah died among all the, the uncertainty and, and, and the fear and the worry and thinking about a future and just saying, what's God, you know, where, where, where are we going to be in another year? In that year, It was that year that I saw the Lord. Right in that moment, God showed up and revealed himself. And this is how God revealed himself to Isaiah. Isaiah says he was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. So the first thing he saw was him seated high and lifted up. The second thing he saw was the train of his robe filling the temple. And if you were a king... The longer your train, the train of your robe was, the more battles you had won. Because in a battle, if they conquered another king, they would tear off the train of that king's robe and attach it to their own robe. And so the longer it gets just represents 
battles won, victories won. And so when Isaiah sees this train of his robe filling the temple, that means the Lord has, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords has uh, won a lot of battles. And you can see what that begins to do for Isaiah. I feel like he's doing it right now. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And so you hear this song of heaven on repeat, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord of hosts. So yeah, we have an understanding of uh, of human military might and strength. It's like the bigger your army is, the more you can conquer. But in this moment, there's these angels singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory over and over and over. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations and the entire building was filled with smoke. And then I said, Isaiah's writing this in first day, and he's like, I said, he didn't say, oh, man, this is cool. He didn't pull out his phone. He's like, I gotta snap a picture, post this. He said, it's all over. Woe is me, another translation says. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy li lips because I live in a people who are crooked, perverse, and unjust. There's something about being in the presence of a holy God that it just exposes our sin and our humanity. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's army. So you feel this tension. And I think we, I feel it when I read this. It's like, man, when I'm in the presence of a holy God, I just see all the imperfections of my own life, all the times that I missed the mark. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And he touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. And we get this little glimpse of the salvation that comes only through Jesus. Amen. So without Jesus, yeah, I am undone. Woe is me. I'm filthy lips and I live among people with filthy lips. So there's only one thing that will cleanse me from my sins, purify me. And it's this hot coal taken off the tongue, taken off with tongues. And it's laid on his lips. And I just wonder if that gives us a picture of what tongues of fire are, this purification that's taking place. Because if you've ever had a hot coal on your mouth somewhere, I don't think you would forget it. I remember as a kid, we were at a campfire. I was probably seven or eight years old, and I was roasting a hot dog with a hot dog stick. And, um, and you know, it was over the fire and, and roasting it, roasting it until it was perfectly done. And I'm like, oh, I'm just going to take a bite, you know, while it's still on there because my brain wasn't fully developed yet. <laughs> And so I took a first bite and it was fine. It was so good. I took a second bite and the tongue of that that was over the fire for like 20 minutes hit my chin. And I remember that 40 years later, I still remember that. And it left a mark. And I just wonder if this picture that we get that there's just like this purification process that is needed as the Holy Spirit comes upon us to purify us from the inside so that we're not just speaking our opinions about things. You know, all week long, we hear people's opinions and it's so tempting and easy just to speak words to try to, you know, give our opinion back on whatever. And I believe God is purifying his church and his people to speak God's words that will pierce somebody's heart. And our opinions will not pierce someone's heart. But God's word through our mouths, if we, if we have the spirit of God come upon us and to, to purify us and to reveal Jesus to us, 
And when Jesus said, you must testify about Jesus, that means I, my life, I want my life to be about revealing Jesus, not revealing me. Amen. So I have to ask myself, do the people that I live with in my home, Kelly and our, our three kids, will they see Jesus by the way I treat them, by the words that I say? And will the people that I work with, will they see Jesus through my words? Well, the way that I interact with, with people that I don't really like or I don't really think the same way that they do, well, they see Jesus through me. I mean, when, I'm, when I think about that, it's like, God, just search my heart because I just too quickly, too easily just give my thoughts and my human reasoning and, and, and what I think about things. And it's like, man, I read my Bible every day, so probably God's word is just getting in me, so whatever comes out is gonna be his word. And I just don't think, I don't wanna just rely on that. I want it to be, God, show me. I want my words to, to be purified. I, want them to, I don't wanna just spout things off. I want these tongues of fire. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna pray for all of us. I just see I this picture in my mind that God is purifying his church from the inside out. And what Isaiah said, as soon as he said, um, as soon as he heard, see this coal has touched your lips, now your guilt is removed, your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking this question, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And I think Isaiah then had this confidence of saying, okay, these are not my words that are gonna go out. These are God's word. And he says, here I am, send me. And so what I would like to do today is to pray for us. I'm just gonna pray for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you believe in Jesus, the presence of the Spirit is in you. But I want to pray for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I want to invite you to stand. And if you're, not, if you're like, I'm not really interested in that, that's fine. You can just stand there and endure this. But if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I want to invite you just to close your eyes just for a moment. It's not going to be long. Would you just put your hands out like this in a posture of humility? A posture of receiving this purification. And God, today I just pray in the name of Jesus, your Holy Spirit, to fill every person who is hungry and thirsty. And God, I believe that you are. Maybe some conviction going on. Maybe some repentance needed. When you're in presence of a holy God, It's like, God, I don't want to just say words so flippantly. I don't want to treat your word as common. God, forgive me when I've been judgmental of other people or made assumptions that I think I know what's happening or what's needed. And I pray we rely on your word your spirit to reveal Jesus to people. I'd invite you if you need to repent. Repentance is just simply acknowledging where you've missed the mark and then bringing it to the cross of Jesus, knowing that it's only through Jesus he has made you right with God. And so when we miss the mark, we bring that, repent of it, 
ask for forgiveness and receive that forgiveness. And receive the grace and mercy of God because he loves you. He is full, God, our God is full of grace. His mercies are new every morning. That's why on this pathway of purification, it's like on the other side, is just peace and joy and renewed hope. So God, thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit working in us, drawing us, filling us. We're not going to be able to do this in our own strength, from our own understanding. So I thank you for speaking to us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Here's what I'd like you to do. You have an assignment. <laughs> you see it on your notes. I want you to read Acts chapter 2 and Isaiah 6 again this week. You know, I probably read it 10 times this past week. It's just like every time, it's like, man, I see something that I didn't see before. And it's just like the Lord continues to reveal, and I want that for you. So I would encourage you to look at, read that again and allow God's word to speak to you. And I truly believe that we're going to see Jesus a little bit deeper through his word and by his spirit, right? Do you receive that today? And I pray that. All right. <laughs> giving, you're wondering if I remember about giving. Um, you know, we, we do giving every week. I have a little bit more of a spiel, but I think it's, we're good to go. You know the drill. Just so grateful for the generosity of this church. And, you know, we do our very, very best to steward what God has given us. And so grateful for people who bring their first to this church. Uh, I was also going to bring an update on our kids' ministry expansion project, where we are with that. It's really good. We're in a great progress, but I'll do that next week. So you don't want to miss that, all right? <laughs> but it's going to be great. Hey, don't forget, you are God's masterpiece. You've been created on purpose for a purpose. Go out this week. Passionately pursue the purpose God has on your life. You'll be amazed at how God can work through you. Have a great rest of your day. See you here next week.